Next on Currents News, the Trump administration's deportation rates are off to a slow start, but migrant fears loom large here in the diocese of immigrants. We'll tell you how one Brooklyn parish is trying to help. At only nine years old, Jack's website, Convert Cuomo, is one of the most influential voices in the pro-life movement. I'm Emily Druby, and that story is coming up. Then, a rare opportunity, an in-depth look into the rebuilding efforts at Notre Dame, three months after that devastating fire almost destroyed the iconic cathedral. I'm Tim Hartman in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and take a look at this. The Giglio structure weighs four tons and stands 72 feet tall. It's the highlight of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Festival. I'll bring you the sights and sounds and even get to help these men lift the structure. That's coming up. Good evening, I'm Tamara Lane. Churches all over the country are trying to help migrants as threats of deportation rattle nerves nationwide. In Brooklyn, Catholics were targeted in Sunday's raids. And while there have been no reported arrests, priests at a local parish are speaking out. Tim Harfman has the story. I think they're absolutely terrified. They are terrified. That's how Father John McKenna described the growing tension in Sunset Park, Brooklyn a community with a large Hispanic population. Residents living in fear as federal ICE agents target nearly 2,000 immigrants across the country. There have been no reported arrests in New York City. Father McKenna is one of the priests ministering to Catholics at the Basilica of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. He received text messages Sunday from a woman whose sister had unexpected visitors, ICE agents. All the people in the, in the uh in the apartment house, I think, just called each other and said, don't open up, don't open up. Father Ruskin Piedra shares a similar story. He provides legal services to immigrants and met yesterday with those targeted by ICE. They raised their voice, open this door and so on. Because what happened in one of the buildings is that the outside door was open. They couldn't get in through the second door. That's where the shouting started. The parish is stepping in to help immigrants. They're working with organizations and local politicians, handing out flyers with their rights. Father James Gilmore is Our Lady of Perpetual Help's pastor. Makes no difference what the situation is. They have rights by law in the United States. Even with protecting the family's identities, the three priests didn't give us much information about who these families are because they say status doesn't matter. We don't ask if you're Catholic, non-Catholic, registered, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're a human being, you're in need, and uh, that's the way we see people. That's how other clerics across the country are reacting. Chicago's Cardinal Blaise Supich wrote a letter to his priests urging them not to let federal agents into churches without identification or a warrant. These Brooklyn priests vowed to stand with immigrants. The law may not uh, see you as a child of God. It's the first thing we do. In Sunset Park, Brooklyn, Tim Harfman, Currents News. And in Connecticut, Catholic bishops are calling for a, quote, complete overhaul of the country's immigration policy. In a letter released just days ago, the bishops are demanding lawmakers do better, writing, those responsible in government need to undertake an examination of conscience as to what they have done and have failed to do when it comes to respect for human persons and the enactment of fair and balanced legislation. Also, this weekend, St. Helen's Church in Howard Beach was allegedly targeted by the man seen in this surveillance video. The sacristy's door and its locks were broken, but nothing was taken, according to the church's pastor, Father Francis Cola Maria. He is concerned that there is a growing drug problem in the Queens neighborhood, leaving addicts desperate for money. He's unsure how much more he can do to protect the parish. I can't prevent a break-in. If they want to break a door down, they're going to break a door down. We have alarms. We have locks. We have electronic locks. I have security cameras. And now I'm going to have to fully alarm the church. It's going to be like Fort Knox. St. Helens has been robbed twice in just four months. The NYPD has the suspect's DNA and fingerprints. Father Cola Maria says the church will be locked until further notice. He's a young Catholic and he's on a mission to change New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's heart after he signed a controversial pro-abortion bill earlier this year. Currents News' Emily Druby introduces us to the passionate child behind the prayer campaign that's gone viral. 
Jack Timmons is a normal nine-year-old boy. He draws, he does his schoolwork, he prays, but he's also a champion for the pro-life movement. Richard said, I will pray for him every day. Jack's reading one of thousands of prayers being offered for New York Governor Andrew Cuomo through his website, Convert Cuomo. It asks people to pray for the governor's conversion and was created in the wake of him signing the Reproductive Health Act, legalizing abortion up to birth. And then I'll, I'll, I'll send instructions how to say if he doesn't know how to. That's Jack. After finding out about the signing, his mom, Anne Marie, says instead of being angry, he was brainstorming how to change Cuomo's mind. I didn't want abortion to keep going on, so, so I wanted to do something about it. Eventually, Jack turned to prayer, knowing from personal experience that it works. He ended up turning totally blue on day two of life, and they air rushed him to um, Westchester Medical Center. His mom says during this scary time, the family leaned on prayer. Friends and family and so many people were praying for him, and he's fine, but he's grown up knowing that story, and his siblings know that story, that prayer works. And now, Jack leans on prayers for the Convert Cuomo campaign. Originally, Jack planned to place boxes for handwritten notes at local parishes, but Franciscan Friars, who Jack reached out to for help, had a different idea. How about an online site where people can sign up to pray fast? So Jack and his father built Convert Cuomo right at this very computer, and it has taken off. It's really good because everybody's like signing up like every night and day, and we have like a 2,130 prayers, or maybe more than that now. The family receives prayers daily. So many proud and inspired by the nine-year-old, including his pastor, Father Patrick Buckley. I think this young man, God has plans for him to go places. He's filled with the spirit, and so is his family. Jack and his website proving that prayers can change the world. Emily Druby, Currents News. The Chilean government has passed a law removing the statute of limitation on sex abuse crimes committed against children. The new law ensures that there will be no time limit in prosecuting cases regarding sexual offenses. The law also allows the victims to take civil action against people or institutions that fail to report sex abuse crimes. It is, however, not retroactive. The Catholic Church is in, uh, currently under investigation in Chile. The Holy Father is speaking out against the humanitarian crisis overwhelming the South American country of Venezuela. In a personal plea, he is asking for peace and also for people to have compassion. Desidero esprimere la mia vicinanza all'amato popolo venezuelano, particolarmente provato per il perdurare della crisi. Preghiamo il Signore di ispirare e illuminare le parti in causa affinché possano quanto prima arrivare a un accordo che ponga fine alle sofferenze della gente per il bene del paese e dell'intera regione. One of the Vatican's biggest mysteries continues to remain just that today. In an attempt to help the family of an Italian teenage girl who went missing nearly four decades ago, the Vatican opened two tombs last week. They were acting on an anonymous tip that alluded to two graves in a secluded Vatican cemetery that might have the remains of Emanuela Orlandi's body. Instead, in a surprise twist, there was no trace of the girl or the two princesses believed to have been buried there. Experts are now in search for all three bodies. It has been three months since the disastrous fire that devastated one of the world's most holy landmarks, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Since then, hardly anyone has celebrated Mass inside. In a rare opportunity, we tour the work site for a look at the progress that's been made in cleaning up the debris and laying the groundwork for reconstruction. Jim Bitterman has more on the story. <laughs> Tourists still make their way to Notre Dame in Paris, but these days their holiday snapshots might look like they visited a construction site. Whether from an overabundance of caution or because those overseeing Notre Dame's rise from the ashes have never dealt with anything quite like this before, the work site is a high security zone. Few are let in, and given the high concentration of lead from the melted roof, all are required to wear special protective jumpsuits. On the roof, a gaping hole where the fire burned most fiercely three months ago. The lead and other debris still litter the parts of the vaulted ceiling which did not give way. 
leading to worries the extra weight could still bring down parts of the building. For the moment, the chief architect is concerned about shoring up the flying buttresses which support the walls and vaulted ceiling. Huge, precisely engineered wooden braces have been put in place beneath the ancient stonework to prevent it from shifting. No one is talking about rebuilding just yet. In fact, the restoration of Notre Dame has not yet started. It could be another nine months or more before that gets underway. Right now, the chief architect says the building is in such fragile condition, it could still possibly collapse. And so, work proceeds very slowly. Debris still remains in the central nave area of the cathedral. The engineer on site says studies need to be made when the walls of Notre Dame are thoroughly dried out to determine how much weight they can bear. Still, he believes President Macron's 2024 deadline for rebuilding Notre Dame is possible. I think by mobilizing everyone and by really committing large teams and major companies, it's doable. It's absolutely doable, but we mustn't waste time. Meanwhile, the treasures of Notre Dame, like the religious relics which were rescued during and after the fire, are safely stored away, many at the Louvre Museum. The stained glass windows are gone, taken away for cleaning and protection. The cultural ministry's conservator on the project says the cathedral's paintings survived surprisingly well. What reassured us when we made a thorough inspection, we saw the masterpieces were all intact. There we were, delighted, especially compared with the state of the building. So, given the state of the building, Notre Dame's rescue is cautious and slow. The cultural conservator says it's like working on an archaeological dig. Indeed, everything, burnt timber or scorched stone, everything brought out of the cathedral is marked with a grid number to indicate where it was found. Even the conservators aren't sure where it will all end up. But they and everyone else working to save Notre Dame know that from a religious, cultural, and historical point of view, they are part of a monumental project unlike any before. Jim Bitterman, Paris. Billions of dollars were pledged to repair the cathedral, but some of that money has yet to actually be donated. A massive power outage in New York City Saturday left nearly 80,000 residents in the dark. The outage, which occurred around 7 p.m., shut down subway service, Broadway shows, and impaired traffic from 72nd Street to 12th Street in Manhattan. Most of the city's power was restored before midnight. Officials are blaming a manhole fire that affected an underground transformer as the cause of the outage, but questions remain. There's a lot more news headed your way. It's one of Brooklyn's most beloved Catholic traditions, the Julio Festival. We'll take you right to the dramatic moment when the Julio spire is lifted high into the air. And the threat of severe weather continues as states in the Mississippi Valley cope with the aftermath of Hurricane Barry. Then Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio takes on several issues that are part of New York's legislative agenda. Into the Deep is next. At the heart of the Italian-American experience in the Diocese of Brooklyn is the Giglio, which took place on Sunday, a feast like you've probably never seen before. The highlight, a four-ton, seven-story tower that peaks above the Williamsburg skyline, lifted by manpower alone. But this more than 100-year-old tradition is in threat of not getting off the ground if something doesn't change. Currents News' Tim Harfman reports that volunteers were needed for the first time in history, and they answered the call with brute force. <laughs> Tens of thousands of spectators filling the streets of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's Giglio Sunday, the highlight of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel feast. What is it like being here on Giglio Sunday? It's magic. It's absolute magic. Nothing in the world can pass this. Helping to make that magic, about 100 men under steel beams, lifting this seven-story, four-ton tower. At the top, a statue of St. Paulinus, an Italian saint. This 116-year-old tradition continues thanks in part to the parish's first ever recruitment drive. Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello, the church's pastor, says nearly 80 new lifters signed up. It not only ensured lifters for the future, but it got a lot of people's attention about the feast and also a lot of young people got involved in it that weren't. Sammy Kosiari is one of them. The 46-year-old grew up in Williamsburg and attended the feast as a child. 
Now a Long Island resident, he wanted to return to his roots and help a fast-changing neighborhood retain memories of the past. To be back, to, to lift, to have that opportunity, it's all I wanted. It's kind of like a, an aspiration to be a lifter one day. For others like John Durante, being part of the feast runs in the family. My father's been coming here, his father's been coming here over 111 years. Durante's been coming here and lifting this Julia. He's now sharing the experience with his children. John's seven-year-old son, Joseph, already has an understanding of the tradition. It celebrates saints in the church and how much you should love Jesus and how he sacrificed himself. These men consider lifting the Giglio a sacrifice of themselves, hoisting the structure as a penance for those who can't and as a way of remembering their deceased loved ones. Sammy's lifting in honor of his cousins. I feel like they're right here underneath the jail with me. Neil Delamonica helps to lead the lifters and says new members like Sammy will keep the tradition alive for another 116 years. It's nice to see some enthusiasm in it once again, and it's also nice to see that all these people want to be involved. They even let me get involved. In Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Tim Harfman, Currents News. The Our Lady of Mount Carmel Feast runs through next Sunday. If you miss the lifting of the Giglio, there are two other opportunities to watch the lift of a lifetime. Wednesday, July 17th, beginning at 7 p.m. and Sunday, July 21st, beginning at 1.30 p.m. New York's legislative session ended a short time ago with some hot button issues still unresolved on the agenda. Ed Wilkinson sat down with Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio to talk about the potential impact on New Yorkers. Thank you. We're going to talk with Bishop DiMarzio today about the recent New York State legislative session which came to an end. Bishop, uh, these always seem to come to a raucous end in the middle of the night and, 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 and people are shuffling around trying to figure out what was passed and what wasn't passed. Now, some of the issues that were hot button issues, everybody was talking about legalizing marijuana. Well, they did not legalize marijuana, but they decriminalized marijuana. What effect do you think that's going to have? And you think this is a right approach that we should be taking? Well, decriminalization should be as a separate issue, really. Uh, again, claiming that uh, especially minorities are unfairly targeted because the enforcement is against them and not other people who are uh, can can smoke it in their their homes and uh, not on the street. And well, that's a separate issue. I don't think that's the same. This, the issue is: is marijuana good for your health? Is marijuana good for the society? Uh, do we want people that are uh, semi-conscious uh, at times because they're smoking pot? That's the issue, the real issue. And uh, they want to tax it. They're going to make a billion dollars a year. What they're going to do with the money, who knows? But uh, I, I think it's the wrong approach. I've already come out with an article clearly stating that the health hazards of, of marijuana, which came from the study they did in Colorado before they legalized it. The, the health department there was very clear. Did a lot of research, 400-page study saying this is not good for health, especially for young people. It, it does affect their brains. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's not good as a public policy. Uh, you know, it may be in the nice to raise money, but it's not good as a public policy for the health of people. So that's why we would be against it. Uh, they're incrementally changing it. Decriminalization, well, let people, you're not going to uh, penalize people or arrest them if they're smoking pot. That's another issue, uh, but is it good for you is the real issue. Yeah. Do you think marijuana is a gateway drug? Some people uh, well, debate that. Well, definitely. It has been. I mean, uh, I don't know how many people can say, well, this is not enough. I want more. I want, I want to feel even better than what I feel when I'm smoking marijuana. So, again, that it's, it has been a gateway drug for many, many people. Uh, does it, it isn't, uh, it isn't uh, necessarily so, but... For most people, it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people wince when they look at the topics that are be, uh, taken up uh, you oh. know, for consideration. And one of them is actually legalizing prostitution. Yeah. Now, thankfully, that didn't really get to the floor for debate. But why are we even talking about something like this? And what would, because I know what the church's a, position is. A liberal is. society wants complete personal freedom. Mm -hmm. There's no responsibility to society. Society has to help you when you want it, but I can do whatever I want. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. There's no, no responsibility of the person to other people. Uh, so uh, there's no basic morality. We were basically a, uh, a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles of morality, the Ten Commandments. Well, that's, that's gone a long way uh, because now it's personal freedom is what is the, the norm, and that's, everything is judged by that.
Yeah. If I want to do it, nobody can <clears throat> stop me. And this is where all of the laws are coming from. Yeah, and uh, on a topic like abortion, where we see uh, laws tightening up across the country, here in New York, we're making more money available. The state wants to make more money available so that people can have... Yeah, people uh, coming from other states to, to New York because uh, we're trying to help them. We're very, uh, very charitable people <laughs> here. Okay. Oh, boy. There's another, there's another uh, topic that didn't really get much play, but and it didn't really get into the debate, I think, and that's sports betting. Mm -hmm. you know? That's something that's a little interesting. Uh, where would we be on something like that? Isn't it just well, again, like the lottery? Uh, sports or? betting is something that if you have the money to do it, uh, it's, if that's your recreation. But, I mean, it's very difficult. People can get addicted to, 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 uh, to uh, wage, wavering, waging on, on things, and it can be very destructive. So... Again, it's a question of moderation uh, in itself. It's not wrong, but it can lead to uh, some difficulties in families, etc. Bishop, thanks so much for okay. shedding some insights on that. And we're going back to the news desk now. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. Pope Francis is remembering Cardinal Paolo Sardi, who died in Rome on Saturday after a brief illness. Sardi served under five popes in a variety of roles, including Secretariat of State. Holy Father praising his intelligence and wisdom in a condolence letter to his family. Cardinal Sardi was 84 years old. With streets still underwater, much of Louisiana is still feeling the effects of Hurricane ba Barry, which made landfall on Saturday as a Category 1 hurricane. While the storm was not as destructive as was once feared, Barry did overwhelm some levees and caused widespread power outages. Dangerous flash flooding is still expected in some areas. Still to come on Currents News, paying homage to the genius of Leonardo da Vinci with an unfinished masterpiece on loan from the Vatican Museum. And a Purple Heart medal that ended up at Goodwill Store in Arizona returned to the family of the World War II veteran it belonged to. And the tablet has a brand new page called Our Diocesan Family, where you can share your pictures of recent baptisms, holy communions, confirmations, marriage, all the joyous sacraments. For more details and to submit your photo, go to the tablet.org slash our diocesan family. Your picture may be published in an upcoming issue of the newspaper. We'll be right back. On loan from the Vatican, a master work of Leonardo da Vinci is now being displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan. The unfinished work titled St. Jerome Praying in the Wilderness can be seen today through October 6th. The painting depicts St. Jerome's years as a desert hermit. The showing is time to mark the 500th anniversary of da Vinci's death. And finally tonight, a good deed by an Arizona Goodwill employee. Talon Mills found a purple heart in a donation bin and with a little help from social media, got it into the hands of Tucson resident Donna Ladano. She is the niece of a U.S. Navy sailor lost at sea in 1942 during a Japanese attack on a ship near Guadalcanal. To see the family so happy I think is the biggest reward for me. And to be a part of that happening, to make someone happy like that, that makes me happy. The timing of the find is amazing, too. Ladano's daughter has just joined the Air Force. That is Currents News. I'm Tamara Lane. Thank you for joining because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.